All right, so let's go ahead and go through the input output practice problems. So first one, we're going to head into review. So here are your two questions. Why is polling better or worse than interrupts? Answer for both. And DMA transfer, is it better than using memory mapped IO? And there's a hint for that one. So go ahead, pause the video, answer the questions together first, and then go and do them with your partner. Okay, so why is polling better or worse than interrupts? Well, why is polling better? Polling is better if you need to get the IO as fast as possible, the lowest latency. So you wanna know as soon as it's ready. And how does polling work? Well, the program is gonna check if the data is ready. So it's gonna sit in a loop going around and around checking if the data is ready. Why are interrupts better? Well, interrupts are better because you don't have to be constantly checking. So here the program doesn't have to spend all its time checking the IO. And why is that? Well, it's because the program gets interrupted when the data is ready. So when the data is ready, the processor actually jumps the program to a particular place where it can handle the data. And then when it's done, it can jump back. All right, is a DMA transfer better than using memory mapped IO? And there was a hint, do they say solve the same problem? So let's think about that. What do they each do? So DMA copies data from an IO device without the CPU needing to work. So instead of the CPU having to write code, which takes data from the device and copies it back and forth, the DMA engine, the direct memory access engine, will do that for you. Memory mapped, however, is a method to access IO devices. So it takes regular load store instructions, instead of sending them to memory, sends them to the IO device. So this is not a valid comparison here. These two things don't do the same thing, but if you put them together, they make input output very efficient. Okay. Now we're gonna take a look at latency versus throughput here. So we've got a bunch of applications here and we've got units for them. And so your job is to put down, what does it mean for latency or throughput here? And we're gonna go ahead and do one together. So spell checking your word processor. So the units here is the seconds it takes per word to check spell checking. And this is about latency. We want the spell checker to finish the word you typed as quickly as possible. It doesn't matter if it spell checks the whole document quickly. We just care about the current word that we're typing. Okay, so go ahead, pause the video and answer the rest of these questions together with your partner. Is it latency or throughput and what does it mean? Okay, let's take a look at these. So sharpening an image, pixels per second. Well, here we're about throughput. We wanna sharpen all the pixels in the image. We don't really care how quickly an individual pixel is sharpened because we care about the whole image. So this is throughput, it's not latencies for pixels. Now logging into a website, this is a tricky one because there's seconds for login and then there's logins per second. And it depends on who you care about. So for an individual user, we care about latency. How quickly can we log in? But companies might care about throughput, how many logins per second. That is how many people they can have logging in at any given time. So here both throughput and latency matter. How about echo cancellation for your phone? So if you have your phone on speakerphone, it needs to cancel out echoes. And this is how long it takes to cancel the echo for each audio sample. And here it's latency. We need to finish the echo cancellation without slowing down the audio. So if we have to wait one second before we can cancel the echo, then it's gonna delay everything by one second. So that's not good. So this is about latency. How quickly can we do it for each audio sample? Okay, here's a question about memory mapped IO. So the question is simple. What does this code do? Here you've got your IO memory map and you've got the contents of your memory and you've got some other information here. So take a look at this code, figure out how it uses the IO memory map and the memory contents to figure out what it does. So go ahead and solve this together with your partner. All right, let's take a look at this here. So I've color coded it to make it easier to see what's going on. So the first thing we do here is we take the letter C and we put it into register one. So register one now has the ASCII value for C. Then we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna loop around here. And in our loop, we're gonna load the current keyboard key pressed. So then we're gonna do a branch if the key pressed equals that letter C that we just loaded. So if the key at C is pressed, we're gonna jump down to continue. And if it's not, we're gonna keep going around in the loop. Okay, so if the key is C is pressed, we go down to here, then we're gonna load from this memory mapped address. This memory map address is gonna be one if the button is pressed. And hey, look what we're doing here. We're checking if it's zero. So if it's zero, we go back around the loop. If it's not zero, we're gonna continue down. So if it's not zero, we go back around the loop. And if it is zero, we go on down here. And what do we do? Well, we put two into R9 and then we write two, R9, to this address. So this address is the disk command. So we're gonna write two here. And if we look down at the disk command, that's sleep. So what does this code do here? Well, this code talks to the memory mapped IO for the keyboard, the mouse, and the disk. 
And it does, if the C button is C key is pressed and the mouse button is pressed, it tells the disk to go to sleep. So this is an example of using memory mapped IO to talk to devices. Okay, let's take a look at doing data transfers here. So here we've got a setup where we've got an address which is mapped to a camera. And when you read from this address, you get the pixels from the image. So each time you read, you get the next chunk of pixels. So your question is how large is each image in bytes and words, and then write the code to copy the data for one picture from the camera, and then figure out how many instructions does the CPU operate? Uh, sorry, does CPU execute? So how much time does this take? So go ahead and solve this together with your partner. All right, let's take a look at this here. So how large is each image in bytes and words? Well, the image is 640 by 480 pixels and each pixel is three bytes. So it's 921,600 9, bytes, which is 230,400 words. So this is how many times we're gonna to have to read from the camera. Now, remember this question we had over here, what do you get when you read from the first time? Well, the first time you get the first set of pixels. So these ones here, and the second time you get the second set of pixels. So we're gonna read from the same address over and over again to get all the pixels. Now let's go ahead and write the code to do this. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna keep track of how many copies we need. We're gonna put that in R3. Then we're gonna use R2 as a counter, which is gonna count up to R3. And then we're gonna round in our loop. Our loop is gonna start off, it's gonna read from the device. So each time we read from the device, we get a new set of pixels. So our pixels come into R4. Then we're gonna write those pixels to the location we're supposed to write them to. So we're supposed to store them in this address. And we're using an offset of R2. Now remember here, R2 is set to zero. So the first time we do this, it'll write them directly to that address. Then we're gonna increment R2 by four. So each time we do this, we're going to go up four bytes or one word. So we're reading one word from the memory, from the IO device, the same location every time. But then after that, we're writing it to a new location in the memory. So we're reading from one place in the memory and writing out to all the places in the memory. And this loop will go around until we get to the end. So when we get up to this number of copies, then we're all set. Okay. So how many instructions do we execute? Well, we've got this loop here and it's gonna go through once for each word. So 230,400 times, there are four instructions in it. So 230,400 times four plus the two instructions at the beginning, 921,000 instructions. Now let's take a look at what we did here. So here's our camera and it's gonna be accessed by the memory controller if we read from this address. So here's our program on the computer and every, oh, sorry, on the processor. And each time we do a read to this address, it will go and get data from the camera get a new pixel from the camera. And then we're gonna to write to it. So when we write, it's gonna go into the memory of the computer and we're gonna start writing at this address, but each time we go along the loop, we increment it by four. So we're gonna end up filling up all of this memory, one picture's worth of memory there, but reading the same address each time in the camera. And remember the camera is an IO device. So each time we read from this location, we get the next pixel. So this will get the whole image into our memory. Okay, now we're gonna do the same thing with DMA. So go ahead, read the instructions here about how you set up the DMA and figure out the same comparison. So go ahead, pause the video and answer this together with your partner. Okay, let's go through this one. So we're gonna do it via DMA. So the first thing we do is we get this information together. This is the address of the camera. This is where we want it to go. This is the number of words to copy. So this is the information that our DMA engine needs. So our DMA engine expects we're gonna put the address into this location the destination to copy it to in that location and the number of words to copy in that location. So what do we do? Well, we go ahead, we put them in all the right places. So this is programming the DMA engine with the information it needs. And then this last programming tells it to start. Now, once the DMA engine starts, it's gonna just do the copy as quickly as it can. And we know it finishes when it sets this address to zero. So on the CPU here, we're just gonna sit here and wait. We're gonna load that address and check if it's zero. If it is zero, we go around. And if it's not, we're all done. Okay. So how many instructions does the CPU execute? Well, obviously we've got these six instructions here at the beginning, but what about these ones here? Well, the DMA engine can do one copy every cycle. So we're gonna sit in here for exactly as long as it takes in order to do the full copy, which is just going to be the total number of times through the image. So that's gonna be 230,400 times. That's how many words we need to wait for. So that many cycles plus the six cycles up there. So how does DMA compare to manual copies? Well, it's four times faster. And it's that much faster because we didn't have lots of instructions in here. We didn't have to do four instructions for each copy. In fact, we didn't have to do any instructions for each copy. Copies happened every cycle, we just had to wait for them. Now question, would interrupts have helped here? Well, no, they wouldn't have. Interrupts would have allowed the processor to do something else. It wouldn't have to sit in this loop waiting, but they wouldn't have sped it up. 
because right now the DMA engine is already doing it as quickly as it can. So let's take a look at what happened with the DMA controller. So here's our setup, and now we've got a DMA engine on the side here. So we've got, these are the addresses we use to talk to the DMA controller, and we're going to set it up with this information. So here we go, run our program, configures the DMA from where it's copying to, from, to, and how many of copies to do. Once we start that up, it's going to read from the camera, and it's going to write to the DRAM. And it's going to do all of this, copying all the data for you. And then when it's done, it's going to allow you to get this information. So every time you read this, when it's done, you're going to say, hey, OK, it's finally over. So the DMA engine just gets this copy from the camera between the DRAM out of the way of the processor so it goes faster. OK, let's take a look at hard disk time. So these are spinning hard disks. And that means they have an average seek time. This is the amount of time it takes for the disk head to move back and forth on average. This is the spin. So this is how quickly the disk is spinning. So this is how long it takes. It takes 8 milliseconds to spin all the way around. This is the transfer rate. So this is how quickly it can move data once it gets to the data. And this is the controller overhead. So this is the time it takes each time you send it a command to get going. And so go ahead and figure out what these times are for using the disk. And there's a hint down here for figuring it out. So go ahead and work on this with your partner. OK, let's take a look at these. So the average time to read a single 1,024 byte sector. Well, we're going to have the time to get there, the time to transfer the data, and the overhead time. So the time to get there is going to be the maximum of these two, because we're spinning at the same time as we're seeking. So whichever one of these takes longer, plus the amount of time it takes to transfer. So one kilobyte over 90 megabytes per second. So that's how much time that is, plus the controller overhead. And we can calculate this, and we get 10.21 milliseconds. Okay, so that's a pretty long time as far as the computer goes for accessing data. Now, what about the time to read 10 sectors in a row? So this is going to change things, because we only have to move once, but then we transfer 10 times as much data. So this amount is the same, but now we have 10 times the transfer. The controller overhead is the same still, because we only do one thing. So if you look at this, this is 10.3 milliseconds. So there's a difference in 10 times as much data that was transferred here, but almost no difference in time. And that's because most of the time was spent moving around to get to the data, not actually transferring it. So once you're there, the transfer itself is almost free. All right, what's the average time to read two different 1,024 byte sectors? So this is the opposite. Now we're going to have twice the time to move. So we're going to have two times this plus a small, small amount of data. So that's going to give us way more. So this is twice the data takes 20.22 milliseconds. So twice as much time if the data is in different places. Here, 10 times the data takes very little more time if the data is right after it. And what's the minimum time to read a 1024 byte sector? Well, that's if you're already right there. So if you don't have to move anywhere, it's just the, over, the transfer time and the overhead time of 0.21 milliseconds. So what you see here from hard disks, hard disks are really good if all of your data is in a row. And they're really slow if you have to jump around for the data. All right, let's take a look at the exponential back off in Ethernet. So Ethernet has this exponential back off, which is a really cool idea and works really well, where you do longer and longer random wait times each time the data is corrupted. So if two devices are transmitting, each one of them will wait, but it'll wait for a random amount of time, an increasingly amount. And so what this means, because it's random, if they collided once, they're somewhat less likely to collide the next time. But because it gets larger and random, after a few times, they're very unlikely to, coll to collide. So here's the back off algorithm. We start off with our multiplier, this thing that makes it longer. And while we're not done, we try transmitting. Now, we check to see if the data was corrupted. If the data was corrupted, we're going to wait some amount of time. So we'll wait our multiplier some, some random amount. And we'll increase our multiplier. This means if we have to do it again, we'll wait even longer the next time. Otherwise, if it wasn't corrupted, we're done. And we just do this over and over again. OK, so two questions for you. How much delay will there be if no one else is transmitting? And how much delay will there be if you have to wait four times? And you can make an assumption about random here. So go ahead and answer the questions together with your partner. OK. Well, if no one else is transmitting, there is no delay because we transmit immediately. And this is great. It means that the exponential back off doesn't slow things down in the best case, which is really a good situation to have. Because a lot of the time, you may be using a network and there isn't anyone there. And you don't want to slow down just because you're waiting for others when there's no one there. All right, how much delay will there be if you have to wait four times? Well, each time we wait around, we multiply this, so we wait twice as long. So the first time we'll wait one, then we'll wait two, then four, then eight. So we'll wait 15 times if we have to wait four times around. So this exponential increase plus the randomness, here we have random always being one, makes it very unlikely that two things will wait the same amount of time. 
Okay, so here are two extra problems. You could pause the video and answer them together with your partner. Okay, so the first question, why do serial communication send two versions of the same signal? And the answer is so they can subtract them out. So if you send a negative and a positive version of your signal, and they both see the same noise, if you subtract them out, you cancel out the noise, but you get a stronger signal coming through. The other question here is about ethernet networks. So they're a serial link that's shared by multiple computers at the same time, either a single wire in a network or a, or a radio spectrum where you can have things colliding. So how does ethernet make sure that other computers don't send at the same time? Well, it's all of these here. The receiver checks the checksum to make sure the data hasn't been corrupted. So this, if it gets corrupted in the middle somewhere, it won't trust it, it will wait for it to be resent. The sender checks at the sent data to make sure it doesn't get corrupted either. So the sender checks the data as it's sending it to see if it's corrupted, and the sender automatically retransmit if the data was corrupted. And this allows the receiver to throw out data where the checksum doesn't work and know that it will get the data again in the future. Okay, so go ahead and do your individual reflection questions. And now go ahead and swap them with your partner and go ahead and see if you can give your partner some feedback.